Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to present this paper. So I'm working on this project with uh, Gerald Schneider, who could not be here. And uh, essentially, our most fundamental interest in this paper is to look at the implications, well, both the causes and the consequences of multilateral election monitoring missions. And so we know that an increasing number of elections is now monitored by international organizations. But what we also know is that the number of organizations doing the monitoring has increased over time. And we also know that increasingly elections are not just monitored by one organization, but by two, three, four, or even five. And so in addition to that, we also think it's important to note that some of the organizations doing the monitoring, and you know, they're the exception, not the rule, um, are actually not as able or willing to criticize problematic elections as others. And so fundamentally what we're interested in is to examine whether the present presence of some of these more questionable monitoring organizations can actually undermine some of the benefits that the international election monitoring regime has provided to uh, domestic politics and also internationally. Um, Okay, and that also when then would obviously create, create challenges and problems for electoral inter integrity, so to connect it a little bit more to uh, the workshop theme. So, <clears throat> um, how I'm going to start, instead of presenting a rather abstract discussion of a theoretical argument, I'm mainly going to try and compare two illustrative cases of elections. And so the two elections that I will compare uh, briefly is the legislative election in Kazakhstan in 2004 and the uh, Peruvian presidential election in 2000. It's a little bit problematic that one was an um, executive election and one was a legislative one, but um, I think for the purposes uh, of uh, our comparison, they work. So what's interesting about both of these cases is that they were both cases or elections that were monitored by multiple international organizations, in fact, three. Um, there are also two elections that were quite fraudulent. So that were, we, we, we know that. Where they differ is mainly in the outcome for incumbents. And the main argument that we're developing in the paper is that because of strategic invitations or strategic, uh, because of strategic, well, I'm not, so, so essentially what we're arguing is that because the Kazakh government was uh, particularly capable in inviting observer organizations that would provide a favorable assessment for actually was, was essentially a fraudulent election that benefited the incumbent in that particular case. So let me show a little bit more about each of the cases. So for the case of Kazakhstan, we can compare the two statements here by the Council of Europe, a very reputable uh, observation uh, organization, and contrast that with the statement by the Commonwealth of Independent States. And we can see that they came to quite contradictory conclusions on the election, with the first one being very critical and arguing that there were major flaws in the election, but the Commonwealth of Independent States uh, coming to the conclusion that essentially, you know, any shortcomings didn't really interfere fundamentally with the electoral process. And so the argument that we're developing in the paper is that essentially by extending observer invitations to these friendly monitoring organizations, and we know that the CS essentially never criticizes elections <coughs> and always provides a more favorable assessment. In fact, you know, we know that the Russians were crucial in, in actually asking for that monitoring organization. And so we're arguing that essentially incumbents could strategically extend these invitations to a combination of more friendly but also more critical observer organizations to then try and offset the more critical reports by pointing to the more favorable ones. And in a way, that's exactly what happened in Kazakhstan. I mean, there's actually a website for the Kazakh Electoral Commission <laughs> where you can look at how they primarily quote from the CIS report, which gave a more favorable assessment of the election, and then very selectively mention portions of the other observer organizations' assessments, and essentially use that in a way to claim as if the election had met international standards and had met the approval of the international community. And so argument would be that, at least in part, the reason why we didn't see the, uh, an annulment of the election or the reason why we didn't see protests materializing after the election could be because incumbents can take advantage of essentially using these more favorable reports and claiming that uh, that provides them with some international legitimacy. Now, if we contrast that with Peru, in Peru, the three organizations present 
were in complete agreement on that fraud had occurred in the election. They uh, uh, were completely unified on that. And uh, we would argue that, at least in part, again, you know, that agreement on fraud uh, helped you know, prom promote coordination among uh, opposition parties, among citizens, and contributed to the occurrence of mass protests after the election and ultimately the ouster of Fujimori. So it also shows that when international organizations agree, uh, when they're reputable organizations, that can actually be beneficial for uh, democracy. So, with that, just outlining the research questions, I talked about how we're interested in both the causes of multilateral monitoring missions, but specifically interested in these combination of lenient and critical organizations. Um, I'm not really going to have time to elaborate on that with the time allotted, so I'm going to focus more on the second question, which also is more consistent with the example that I just illustrated. So we're primarily, today I'm going to show, I'm going to show our results for what the consequences of these invitations to a mix of critical and friendly organizations are. So in terms of the literature, uh, we think that uh, our piece builds on, you know, primarily the, the literature on election monitoring and information transmission. And we know, that from, we know from that literature that essentially when international observers document that major fraud occurred in election, how that can facilitate coordination, how that could function as sort of a focal point, how that could lead to protests, uprisings, uh, to essentially express discontent against that fraud. Now the question that we're asking is, does this also work, or essentially what we're trying to evaluate, does this also work when incumbents strategically try to offset or undermine these more critical reports by inviting organizations that essentially are going to give them a favorable assessment? And the other uh, line of research that we contribute to is uh, Kelly's uh, uh, study on the benefits and the costs of multilateral election monitoring missions. And uh, essentially, you know, we can think of our results as very much uh, giving us some additional ideas on what those benefits and costs could be. So with that, uh, this is the main hypothesis that we're evaluating when it comes to the consequences of uh, multilateral election monitoring missions and specifically looking at these mixed observation missions. And again, as I outlined, uh, we're arguing primarily that essentially incumbents can use the more favorable assessments by lenient reporters, by lenient observers to try and offset the more critical ones and then essentially portray those to the media, publicize the more lenient assessments and try to thereby undermine outcomes that we could really think about as outcomes that are undesirable from the perspective of incumbents, right? Because they prefer not to be removed. They prefer not to be faced with protests uh, over election outcomes. And they also prefer not to have to use repression to quell such protests. So with that, I'm going to move into the research design. So our data on elections and also on election monitoring come primarily from uh, the NELDA data set and the DM data set. Now, I'm not going to talk about the models of observer invitations. I'm going to focus on post-election outcomes. And so dependent variables are dummy variables that code whether an incumbent was removed irregularly or, the, or whether election results were annulled, despite the incumbent having won. Uh, then we have a variable that codes protests and riots after elections and a variable coding repression. And our key independent variables in the election outcome models are the type of observer invitation. So, and essentially this requires a little bit of explanation, which is why I'm going to show a table on what the distribution of these different types looks like. Uh, but essentially what we're coding is both the number and also the type of observer organizations. And the number of observer organizations is relatively straightforward. Uh, the quality requires more explanation. And essentially the way we've operationalized the quality of election monitors for this paper is to use a very restrictive definition, meaning that we actually only code organizations as low quality that never or almost never criticize elections. And we would argue that this is most in line with our theoretical expectation, because essentially what we're interested in is how is, is so essentially what we're interested in is incumbents who worry about a negative report, who essentially extend an invitation where they're almost guaranteed to also receive a more favorable assessment. So we think it makes sense given our argument. Now, I haven't really talked about this yet, but so in addition to the presence of these mixed observation missions, uh, of course we would only expect the punishment of incumbents to occur if they actually engage in fraud during the electoral process. So we also include a variable that measures the presence of election fraud in interactions between the observer invitations variables and the fraud variable. 
And then we also do some matching to deal with the issue of, uh, deal with the problem that uh, election observers are not randomly uh, invited by countries. In fact, we know that you know, certain types of incumbents, certain types of countries are much more prone or likely to invite observers, and uh, I can talk about that more if there are questions. So, okay. So I'm running low of time, on time. So this just shows you a little bit on what the distribution of observer uh, invitation numbers and types looks like. And we see the very few cases that invite low quality observers. And, and that actually makes sense because what's really the point of inviting only uh, uh, low quality observers that certainly will not give you international legitimacy. And that's also probably the reason for why we observe zero cases of <coughs> organizations uh, of countries inviting only low quality, uh, two or more low quality observers. Now, the mixed category is the category that we're most interested in, so where observers invited a reputable organization such as the OAS, such as the Carter Center, but combined that also with an extension of an invitation to an organization like the Commonwealth of Independent States or the African Union. And there are quite a few cases in that category, but probably comforting to uh, international organizations involved in election monitoring, the vast majority of invitations are actually extended to high quality observers. So with that, to move into the results, because I am running out of time. Um, so th there are a lot of numbers on this table. And uh, what I would like to draw your attention to is first the uh, coefficients for the interaction between the mixed observer missions and the fraud variable. And you can see here that none of these coefficients are significant when our expectation was actually that the presence of these mixed missions together with fraud would reduce the likelihood of these post-election outcomes, the election outcomes that, that incumbents prefer to avoid. And so in a way that's bad news for our hypothesis, but if we contrast that with the um, positive and significant coefficients for uh, two models of the one high quality observer and interaction with the fraud, with fraud, and two high quality observers and interaction with fraud. Uh, if we contrast it with that, we see that from the perspective of incumbents, we can actually see this as, a, as an improvement, right? So, so you're not punished. Uh, so we, we lose that significant relationship between the presence of high quality observers and the presence of fraud for the incumbents that invite a combination of low quality and high quality observers. So the results are not quite as strong as we uh, uh, were expecting them to be, but uh, uh, I think the conclusion that uh, uh, these invitations, these strategic invitations can help avoid some of the costly consequences of monitoring is warranted. We need to do more sensitivity analysis because obviously a lot of this comes down to how we define low quality and high quality organizations and, and also we need to uh, run more models so I think we're certainly not completely where we want to be with the paper. Uh, the other thing I want to say, you know, in, in a way this is good news for, for international organizations doing election monitoring, uh, the policy implications mean that essentially you know, we know that the supply of these low quality monitors is really concentrated on, on two geographic regions, right? So Africa and then the post-Soviet sphere. So in a way, you know, this is a problem potentially to worry about only in those two regions. In other regions, there, there really are not these low quality monitors available to, uh, uh, for incumbents to engage in this kind of strategic behavior that we outlined. So with that, I really need to conclude. And uh, thank you. <laughs>